I mean, it, it was it was all it is all fashion. Oh my god, that cocktail's coming out now. Um, <laughs> they plied us with drink. If you're listening to this. Um, Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this new podcast, The Guest. Um, each of these episodes features a different guest in conversation with someone who really knows them. And we are recording this episode after dinner with our friends in London who have stayed on to listen to tonight's conversation. And I am so honored to be here with Monroe Bergdorf, who is just, you know, um, a force of nature oh, and a very inspiring woman and an icon. Oh, my God. And um, I, you know, basically we were, we're going to get into a range of um, topics tonight, but I think we should just start off by introducing ourselves. And so essentially I'm Kenya Hunt. I'm an author and I'm the deputy editor of Grazia. And I've already introduced you to Monroe, but I thought Monroe, you could kick us off by just telling us a little bit about mm. yourself in your words. Okay. Um, in terms of like what you do, mm -hmm. who you are and what you're about. Okay. What I do, I think, is pretty broad. I like to speak about identity um, in all of its facets um, through my own experience, but also critiquing the way that social systems work and how we interact with them um, in many different um, aspects of society. Um, but largely, I work within the fashion and beauty space to talk about, you know, expression um, how we present ourselves, how we um, code each other, how we code ourselves within this world. And um, yeah, I think that aesthetics, you know, we, we all have one. We all have a look. We all gravitate towards, towards certain things. Um, and I think that there's a lot of power in that and understanding why we do that and how we do that and where that comes from. Um, and what I'm about, I just, I don't know, I just want to like live in a better world. I feel like we live in a world that, you know, people don't think enough. Um, all of us, I mean, we're never done learning. And um, when we interrogate um, what we're presented with um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I feel like we have a better understanding of the world that we're in and a better understanding of ourselves. Now, I'm excited about this conversation because I love to look at fashion within the wider context of the world that we live in and sort of really like explore the emotions and the politics behind what we wear. And so I feel like you're the perfect person to do that with in this conversation. So I thought mm -hmm. it'd be great to just, first of all, start by talking about some of your earliest encounters with fashion and what really drew you to it like in, and mm -hmm. led to your career as a model. Um, I just, I mean, I grew up, kind of in solitude like I grew up in a um not literally in solitude <laughs> but solitary <laughs> confinement but I grew up in the countryside and it was a very very white conservative mindset area not necessarily voting but conservative mindset and like there just wasn't really anything around me immediately that I could that I felt reflected me so I really like lived in fashion magazines lived in like pop culture lived in you know MTV um watch my MTV show on Thursdays <laughs> and um yeah I just kind of like live like in that escapist world like a parallel universe that I like people that I could see myself in or elements of myself in so like fashion kind of just became that escape for me um and like not just necessarily fashion but like style and people that were expressing themselves in like different ways like I don't know I remember like Cindy Lauper, Madonna, Lenny Kravitz, Prince um all of these people that you know you just never really seen anybody like them that just they had their aesthetic but they were just very submersive and their the way that they looked just challenged society and I felt without realizing it because I didn't know that I was trans, but I knew that I was trans. I didn't know what the word was yeah. for it. And I think that that difference in how they looked from what I was seeing was like my entry point into understanding how fashion could really liberate people that didn't see themselves in the world around them. Absolutely. And now you're doing that for many others who I'm are trying. coming up. You yeah. absolutely are. So I'd love to just hear about some of those kind of like important standout moments. You just, you know, highlighted a few of them. Mm. But I guess, you know, those sort of earliest formative years, that journey from young, youthful Monroe growing up mm. to your earliest days as a model. Like what mm. were some of those standout moments that got you there to the modeling stage? Um, I don't really think that I ever set out to 
be a model just because I didn't, you know, I'm not traditionally skinny, tall, um, you know, like on paper, don't fulfill the criteria. But I feel like the people that really inspired me growing up were the people that didn't fit the criteria, but still did it. Yeah. And, you know, like people like Madonna, people like Skin from Skunk and Nancy, people that just really just, you know, took up space in a space where traditionally they weren't meant to. And, you know, I, I recognized that very early on, especially working in the fashion industry. I mean, I was getting to work with so many amazing people, like straight off the bat. Like I, I shot with David Bailey in like one of, as a, with one of my first shoots, like Nick Knight, who's like been my hero since I was in high school. I did like my art projects on him. And I was getting to work with all of these people and there wasn't any trans people in the industry really at that point that, you know, they were, they were we've always been there, but like we weren't getting the, the opportunities. And at that point, Andrea Pajic was, you know, the the model that was subverting gender and everyone was like looking to androgyny, but there wasn't really any trans women being celebrated. So to be able to work with these amazing people and push myself and fulfill kind of like a dream, but also not necessarily fulfill the criteria I felt was like really special to me. And I feel like it just kind of like obviously spoke to other people. Definitely. I mean, there's that old saying that, you know, you can't be it if you can't see it. But I think it's especially powerful when you can't see it and you you manage mm. to be it anyway. Like you really carve out that space for yourself mm. through that, the power of possibility, you know, and self-belief. Mm. And I think that's, you know, a really incredible thing. Mm. You know, that's one of the things I love about your story, essentially. Yes. Um, and so, you know, you've gone on to, be, you know, become a number of firsts, you know, throughout your career and you have quite a lot of career ahead of you. You know, it's not like you've been around all that long, mm. like you've accomplished a lot in a short amount of time, I'd say. Um, so you're now on the diversity and inclusion board for L'Oreal. You've become involved in important charity work. You've launched a podcast and also been the first black trans woman on the cover of magazines. And so I think, you know, at this stage, sitting here right now, reflecting on what you've accomplished so far, you know, how, I guess, how are you feeling? I mean, we were just chatting like before we even started, mm -hmm. you know, recording about the year, <laughs> the past year that you've yeah. had. <laughs> so like, how, how are you feeling right now at this moment? Basically, you know, uh, you've accomplished a lot. There's a lot to come. Yeah. How, I just, you know. Yeah. I, I do find it difficult to, I mean, I did an interview with Owen Jones and The Guardian at a really bad time. Um, and I was being, um, I was being, I was kind of like subjected to a witch hunt by this anti-trans charity that got me sacked from the NSPCC. And then Owen Jones was like, come on and do an interview. And I was like on the verge of tears throughout the whole thing. But he was like, you're the most visible trans person in the UK. And like, I didn't even think about it up until that point. And then I was like, that's kind of wild. And then like on top of that, working with certain brands and being the first person and it just kind of, I don't know, I, I feel like a massive amount of pressure a lot of the time and to, to always say what's going on and to always talk about the negative things when I think that it's also really powerful to like lead by joy and to yeah. like be what you want for yourself. Yeah. Because when you are what you want for yourself, then you are also being what other people want as well that see themselves in your story. So that's what I'm really trying to do. I spent a lot of time, especially as we were talking around like 2020, like talking about what was going wrong because there was so much going wrong. And like we were so isolated, we weren't really living in the real world because you know, what we had was our phones and our laptops um, yeah. because we couldn't leave the house. And I don't know, I feel like now that we're out in the real world, I really want to be creating. I really want to like actually be living and doing and achieving what I feel my purpose is. And I don't feel like my purpose is necessarily just to be educating people on what is going wrong. I feel like we need to be proving and demonstrating what can go right. Mm, yeah, and I love that. And I think, that. you know, you, you, need to, you need to just do it rather than, you know, constantly just echoing 
what's going wrong. It's, I don't know. I think particularly now off the the back of all the revelations that have come out around Facebook and how the algorithms work and what gets prioritized, Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you raise a really important point. Mm. And I think it's important for people to really reflect and like interrogate our behaviors, Mm. essentially. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about, you know, um, reality and online. And I feel like when it comes to activism and the cross-section between fashion and activism, like obviously fashion thrives online. Um, and, you know, I mean, it used to be that we all go to, sh- we don't all go to shows, but a very um, specific, you know, very um, kind of like the top line goes to like the shows and yeah. then that's spread out to the press. But like now it's all about, you know, getting that out to the people and, you know, um, social media really is a show. So um, for me personally, I'm trying to like take myself offline Mm. as much as possible and create other mediums because the way that activism is, um, you know, filtered, especially through like Facebook and, you know, Instagram and um, various social media outlets, the algorithm doesn't make space for it. No. So I feel like, you know, we need to like figure out a way to, you know, exist in the real world as well as benefit from the exposure that social media, but also uh, the social media provides, but also recognize that it doesn't prioritize certain people. It doesn't. I mean, there's a lot of amazing things that can come out of it, but it's not always the safest space for trans people, trans women, black women. It's, you know, it can actually be quite a dangerous space. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts about what you think these, these, companies should be doing to sort of protect people, I think particularly people from marginalized backgrounds Mm -hmm. who engage on, you know, on these platforms and who have large, you know, who are hugely influential like yourself. What do they need to do? The problem is, is that the safety isn't coded in. Mm -hmm. So, and also growth is prioritized over the safety. Yeah. Because I think that the way that AI works, <clears throat> it reflects society, but also it magnifies society. So it kind of exacerbates the problem. Mm-hmm. But if the coding itself is diversified and interrogated, and you know we've got coders that are from marginalized backgrounds, and so the the very fabric of social media is recalibrated to um, protect rather than to grow. Um, and to recognize and prioritize marginalized voices rather than suppress um, and to protect the status quo um, because that's essentially what it's doing. It's yeah. just taking what's, I mean, we, we see news story after news story in the, in the press about how ethical AI turns racist over time exactly. because the people that are coding it, you know, aren't from marginalized backgrounds. And, you know, even if you are the most well-intentioned person consciously, subconsciously, your experience is not of a marginalized person. So there's going to be spots. And, you know, if AI's job is to reflect reality, then reality is racist. So it's, you know, we need to, we need to figure out a way to actually really understand the way that algorithms work. Because what's so terrifying to me, I don't know if you watched a documentary called Coded Bias on Netflix, but um, it's um, a black woman who um, is interrogating. She found out that, um, AI doesn't recognize black faces, trans faces, women as much as they recognize white men Mm -hmm. because white men are the ones that are creating the algorithms and creating coding and that are largely coding in Silicon Valley and providing the fabric of social media. So that is who it prioritizes. So that is why we see certain people have massively high engagement and gender diverse people, black people typically have less followers, less engagement because the algorithm doesn't, doesn't serve. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, we need to figure out a way to like get into the system of that and to um, directly diversify Silicon Valley. 
Absolutely. Um, and, you know, just to go back to your points earlier about like the way that you're consuming social media and how that's changed with time mm-hmm. and how you're spending more time out in the world. I think that's, you know, there's real power there as well. Um, just on like an individual basis, like just really sort of assessing our, reassessing our relationship to these tools and these platforms and how we engage with them. Um, but that said, you know, I would actually like to talk quite a bit about your relationship with fashion Mm -hmm. because I think that's something that we don't know as much about in terms of, you know, we know who you are and the way that you use your platform and we follow you on social media, but there's just like some of the kind of lighter and more fun aspects of fashion and the emotions behind why we wear what Mm -hmm. we wear. I'd like to kind of dig into that a little Mm -hmm. bit now with you. Um, so, I mean, I guess, I, you know, the, the title of this podcast is Femininity and the Universal Power of Clothing. So I think, you know, you know I'd really just like to talk a bit about sort of the, the crafting of Monroe Bergdorf and, you know, your personal adornment and display and how that's mm. a real reflection of who you are. It's not an easy thing for anyone to sort of develop and cultivate one's personal style. Mm. Um, and so I'd love to just hear you talk about like the beginnings of it. Like, you know, what, who influenced you, those, those designers that you really started liking mm. to wear from the beginning? <laughs> And what uh, led to who you I are just, now? I always gravitated towards like theatrical people, period. If it's <laughs> you, and like it doesn't need to be just be fashion. It's like I mean it, it was it was all it is all fashion. Oh my god, that cocktail's coming out now. Um, <laughs> they plied us with drink. If you're listening to this. Um, but I don't know, I, I, even when it was like, you know, the fabulous teachers in school and you're just like, oh my God, you're scary, but I love you because yeah. you're just like, I don't know, there was this, um, she's passed away now, but there's this teacher at my school and she was terrifying. She was called Fiona Farrell Shaw. Oh, that's a terrifying name. Double barrel name, but like she was fab. And like, I just loved that she was just, she had this camp aesthetic and she looked like, do you remember like um, Angelica's mom in Rugrats? Yeah. With the, like the waist and like, she turned up like that um, every day at school in these huge heels and she was so mean, but she was so camp with it. And I was just like, I don't know, I, her and then also like pop stars and... Um, like who? who? Give us a few examples. Know, like Jerry Halliwell, like, I don't know, Diana Ross, um... Just anyone who is over the top and unapologetic about it. Uh, Because it wasn't so much like just the aesthetic. Because you can be quietly camp. You can be overtly camp. You can be like me, like kind of like, you can be, you know, girl next door and just be camp with it. Like absolutely fabulous. Like Adina or like, um, you know, her her daughter's like still camp, but like kind of understated. Um, So I just, I just gravitated towards ridiculousness but people that own it and are comfortable in just expressing that silly side but like also in an artistic sense and it's I think campness and glamour is very curated but it can also be like a guard Mm. and when I was growing up obviously I'm trans and like to be feminine when I was a kid and you know not be um, a girl or a cis girl um, is really was really looked down upon. So like my femininity was always, always like something that I was told not to do. So it made me want to do it more. And um, it became like a secret escape. Mm. And um, I really started to revere that for myself. And it, I just always, I never really understood like why femininity or, you know, to be effeminate was um, seen as something that I shouldn't do because I always felt like it made me powerful. Yeah. And as soon as I got away from the town that I grew up in, that's when I really embraced it and just like latched on to everything feminine that I could because that was my power. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that... Um, fashion and style have really been a way for me to understand myself and understand my place in the world and also interrogate, you know, who I am um, and to map my growth. Um, I think it's like a journey and, you know, the way that I started dressing at the beginning of my transition is not the way that I'm dressing now and 
the way that I dress in 10 years' time won't be the dress, way that I'm dressing now. So, How has it changed, uh, you know, how you're dressing now compared to how you were at the beginning of your transition? Well, a lot of it's access. Yeah. I mean, I probably am now dressing the way that I wanted to dress at the beginning of my transition. Because I've got the funds and I've got... Yes, <laughs> we the love bag. the funds. Um, <laughs> so, like, there's, there's that. Uh, but also... I don't know. I feel like you you grow when you take risks. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that I love about me when I started my transition was I was taking risks and I looked <laughs> a mess. I looked a hot mess. But I, I was at least taking risks. And like Calvin, um, who is here, um, knew me at the beginning of my transition. And like, so, I mean, I, I, I'm really proud of my growth. And I'm proud that, you know, I, I did it my way and I didn't try to conform yeah. to um, what I thought I should be wearing. I just, you know, and even with makeup as well, I, 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 I just feel like I was a sponge and mm. I just put myself in certain spaces and tried to soak it up as much as possible. And my mum always says that you're like, you are the company you keep. And I don't think that it's just, you know, kind of in terms of bad influences or good influences. I think it's really about, you know, you are the energy that you're around. And yeah. I've always tried to surround myself with energy that is progressive and that challenges me and that I can challenge. And that's how I see my friendships as well. I, yeah. I like to surround myself with people that um, encourage me to grow and that I'm inspired by and that are um, doing the same thing as me, just trying to like make something for themselves and um, understanding them their place in the world. Many people describe moving to London as transformative mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, just growing into one's personhood, but also in terms of like developing, cultivating, cultivating one's sense of style as mm-hmm. well. Tell me about, about what that was like for you moving to London and how that uh, impacted you. Well, I moved to London in 2009. And then I started working in fashion. I've worked in fashion publicity uh, for a well-known PR firm, one of the biggest in London. And so I was like PRing Calvin Klein. I was PRing like Lacoste, Puma, like the big clients. Yeah. And so I really had a crash course. And like, it really was like working in an ug- ugly Betty office. It was a lot. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily fun. It, mm-hmm. You know how fashion can be. Um, it was very much like I was an account executive. So I was in a lower level. And I was really just trying to cut my teeth. I was being bullied to high heaven by my manager, mm-hmm. um, who was also trying to prove herself as a manager. And it just, you know, it was a, it was it was a really, really tough um, experience, but it was, you know, I, I really feel like it was such an exciting time. And I remember when Lee Alexander McQueen passed away and the whole office was just like in mourning and like he was my favorite fashion designer as well. Like I, I was so inspired by him when I was a kid because I really felt like I, he was the one of the only designers where it's kind of like you just kind of had like a window into his mind. And that that was like what I tried to do as well with like my, obviously I'm not comparing myself to Alexander McQueen, but like in terms of spirit, like I feel like letting somebody into like your mind Mm -hmm. with how you present what you create is something that's really inspiring to me. So um, I'm kind of all over the place with this answer. <laughs> no, but, um, but I'm into Yeah, it. Uh, moving to London was very transformative. I had a real, you know, crash course in the first few years. It, it was tough. London is really, really tough, especially like working in the fashion industry. Especially at that time. <laughs> I think because I moved here around the same time, yeah. like the end of 2008. And it was like before all these discussions that are happening in fashion yeah, you now. Said it, <laughs> It was horrible. It, it, it wasn't. Was it wasn't good. Easy, like no. we hadn't had any conversations about bullying. We hadn't had any conversations about you know um, how you should be treating your interns. Um, we hadn't had any conversation about racism in the fashion industry no. or like you know no, misogyny. Me too. No, me too. Nothing. It was kind of like the wild west, if I'm honest. <laughs> and it wasn't just exclusively to this agency. It was the whole industry. Yeah. Um, so it was very tough and. I knew that I wanted to transition, but I didn't think I was going to be supported in the workplace. And the year that I quit working in fashion PR was the year that the Gender Recognition Act passed, which Mm. meant that in 2010, it became illegal to sack someone for being trans. Mm. And that was the year that I quit. And I didn't actually understand what the law um, 
I didn't understand that the law was actually changing to protect, protect me. But then I think back and I was like, well, if I didn't understand that, then other people in the, the industry wouldn't have understood that and it probably would have happened anyway. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we've come a long, long way, especially from that time. So, I mean, in a way, we've all transitioned as an industry. Yeah. Um, and I love the changes that are here because now seeing, you know, people work in fashion PR that are transitioning within the workplace and, you know, within the workplace as a trans person, you, the trans community has got such a high unemployment rate mm-hmm. uh, because people feel and people aren't supported within the workplace. You're exactly right. Um, and we have, I mean, the industry has come a long way, but even in just the past two years, mm-hmm. you know, there's so much growth and uh, progress that we've seen. And I think, you know, people like you have played a real key part in that. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, I loved hearing you mention Lee McQueen because I feel like he made so many um, really powerful and compelling statements about what it means to be feminine, um, how womanhood could look like he presented like a range of sort of um, really interesting possibilities for like what womanhood can look like Mm. um, from his perspective as a creative director. And so I'd like to ask you like, what does, you know, in the interest of like tying things back to the theme of this podcast, like what does feminine dressing mean to you? What does it look like? And how do you express your femininity through Uh, dress? Well, femininity for starters is, is, um, It's limitless and I feel like it is, I mean, it is the underdog. We live in a patriarchal society, so I feel like femininity in essence is resistance because everything is pushing us to harden, everything is pushing us to, you know, um, numb ourselves to um, succeed in in a society that inherently favors the masculine so for me as somebody who should be the masculine by society's standards to embrace the feminine I feel is like resistance and I you know it's ever growing and it changes and I I'm you know I Parts of my femininity I've been told are actually masculine that, you know, I mean, femininity can be strong and femininity can be, you know, powerful and commanding and all of these things that we've been told are inherently masculine are actually, you know, feminine. It's that, you know, people that are feminine haven't been given the opportunity to um, or the platform to um, fully, you know, interrogate that in a public forum and I feel like the conversations that we've been having very recently are incredible I mean I was talking to um hasn't come out yet so it's a bit of an exclusive but um <laughs> I was talking to um Jade Thurwell from Little Mix about the powers of the power of girl bands um on my podcast <clears throat> and how um in her Brit Awards um speech acceptance speech when they became the first um girl band to win the um best band category and um they celebrated all of the girl bands that have never been nominated for a Brit Awards. And I just started thinking that they weren't taken seriously because they were women. It wasn't just because they were pop stars. It was because they were women. It's because the way that they presented themselves was seen as lesser or seen as silly. Mm. And the reality is, is that they were empowering so many gay guys, so many girls, so many feminine people or people that exp- that embrace a feminine part of themselves. And like, you know, I mean, if you tell, if you ask any girl, there's, I'm pretty sure that there's, you know, a female pop star that has, you know, hasn't been celebrated that they adore. And I don't know, I think femininity is the underdog. And I don't know, I'm a big champion of the underdog. <laughs> Same. I, I really like the way that you framed it as well as like being quite radical. I mean, growing up, I never understood why it was always like viewed as a sign of weakness yeah. or a signifier of weakness. I almost, I just always felt really like deeply offended by that growing up. Yeah. Um, and Because you're right, it is, you know, it's, it's this incredibly powerful thing. I mean, are there any ways that, are there, is there anything in particular that you like to wear that makes you feel particularly powerful? Um. Not necessarily, but I mean, I do. I do like a really 
ridiculous heel. I, I, I just do. Because I don't know, I feel like, you know, for so long, you just, I was I was told that I shouldn't do it, which made me want to do it more, which made me want to wear it more. And I don't know, I do like a good Louboutin. <laughs> Louboutin is a good, a good, very Fidel. good shoe. I know, yeah, I do. I do like a good Louboutin, <laughs> a sparkly Louboutin, a very high one. Um, and then, so you're obviously a deep appreciator of camp, mm-hmm. um, which I love. Mm-hmm. I feel Have like, you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're really enjoying a bit of a camp revival. We are off the back of like you know this really kind of like serious, intense like period these past two yeah. years. And it's just been such a joy to see, even like sitting here in this room, like seeing people really enjoying dressing up again, yeah. being unapologetic and joyful. And like, so, I mean, I just, I'd love to just hear more about you and like why you love camp and, you know, I guess maybe any sort of like any particular personalities or works, films that you can shout out to our mm-hmm. listeners who, um, you yeah. know, have inspired you. Well, I mean, I, I love drag and I, when I first moved to London, that's how I paid my bills. Um, not necessarily performing drag, but I, I worked on the door at many drag clubs. And that's really how I, uh, you know, paid my rent. That's how I survived. Um, and from the age of 18, I, yeah, I, I kind of just kind of did drag and that's I just that's that was my entry level into like gender expression and to understanding like myself and you know just trying to get onto the pathway of understanding my femininity um and I don't know I feel like camp has always been something I mean I'm 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 inherently camp and I love it I I love big hair I love like kind of people that can just express themselves and like drag is that for me um you know pop certain pop stars did that for me um I remember watching Tu Wong Fu Paris is Burning uh Priscilla Queen of the Desert um oh god I I was obsessed with Cindy Lauper when I was little I was I had a I had a DVD uh, not a DVD I had a VHS of um Cindy Lauper's greatest hits and she's just the campus woman on earth and I just love just like people that are just unfiltered and I yeah. feel like campness is the like is an unfiltered expression of self yeah and I think we've all got a bit of camp in us absolutely I mean I remember the very first time I saw Paris is burning yeah. and just wanting to like go back in time and live in that world yeah. like it was just so um you know so incredible but um, yeah, I mean, there's, it's, there's a really kind of beautiful moment, I think, that's happening within fashion right now. And that's, you know, in terms of the way that people are engaging with dress again. Mm-hmm. Like how, I mean, so how has the past 18 months mm-hmm. impacted the way that you approach mm-hmm. getting dressed? Do you have, do you feel like you've had a heightened appreciation for it now that things are open yeah. again and we're going back out I into do. the world. I found myself dressing very nomcore during lockdown. And yeah, I, I was, we all were. I went back to like cottage chic and like kind of gingham and stuff like that. And it was a mood. I loved it. Um, so it was like kind of like that, but then also I was kind of really kind of like doing full glam as well. But like now that we're back out in the real world, I kind of like, I don't know, I, I'm really appreciating going out again and I feel like events people have really started to embrace glamour again yeah. and you know we've been starved of connection and I, I love seeing other people's outfits as well it's not always about like how I dress like I love seeing like Maxim Magnus mm-hmm. at parties because like no one can outdress her <laughs> like they can try but no one can outdress Maxim Magnus like a Tamara Gavadia like Every single time a look, Reese King, every single time, every single shoot, Billy Langdon's coming up. I'm just really like, I just love seeing how people express themselves because I feel like it's beautiful, like to see someone being themselves and, you know, going against what they are told they should do. Because really, you know, if if we all went and did what we should do, then life would be really boring. Really, be really boring and very samey. Very it samey. It does feel like the last 18 months has unlocked something. Because even just scanning the room and seeing how many people are wearing shimmer and feathers and texture and well, we all these things. Well, we tell them to. <laughs> <laughs> that but, helps too. No, but like, it, it, 
but like this is kind of how everybody dresses anyway and like I I, I don't know it's just a nice reminder isn't it yeah and like I love but we said camp and glamorous but like it's everybody understood the assignment because like I'm seeing so many feather motifs and like that isn't just like what people have chosen to wear that really is like the the zeitgeist right now. I think so. People have been locked in their houses. People being locked away from each other. And I feel like you know we are all peacocking for each other, but not not in a way where we're trying to you know have like relations with each other. But we're we're I feel like <laughs> we are like showing each other that we're here. And yeah. I feel like when we were locked in the house, we couldn't be ourselves. And that really is the trans experience. I'm I'm sorry to tell you. Like, it really is. I mean, like, trans people, you know, I mean, that that is, you know, we, we spend so long, like, being told that we can't be who we are. So when we have the opportunity, I feel like it's, that is why trans, the trans experience is so beautiful because mm -hmm. it is, you know, an amalgamation of everything that we're told we shouldn't be yeah. and genuine resistance and, um, self-love um in a way that is physicalized could talk to me about your community and you know who uh is in your support network basically because mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like you have a really beautiful one and i'm witnessing it and i've gotten to meet you know yeah. some really great people here tonight um yeah I, i've got really great friends i've got really great friends a lot of my friends like kind of work within the industry uh, or you know I, I mean I'm not really somebody who's like a friendship group person but like I do also have like different friendship groups so I don't like kind of put all of my eggs in one basket I, I like to you know have like different like friends in different scenes and like expand my world as much as possible but I'm, I'm usually like a one-on-one -on -one person I'm like a secret introvert and I, I like to kind of you know have one-on-one -on -one friendships or like be alone and then go out and you know recharge again but um yeah I I don't know I, I've got really amazing friends and I think that it's really important that you know I don't have any frenemies I don't do frenemies I'm very 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 selective with my friends and you know I urge everybody to be I don't think enough people are and you end up kind of having competitive friendships or feeling like you need to outdo or prove yourself and like I don't do that as soon as I feel like that's it you know I don't I don't I don't remove myself from that situation. Yeah. So I am pretty cutthroat with who I have in my life. It's healthy, I think. It is. Yeah. Some people call it ruthless, but I, <laughs> I think it's, it's healthy. It's active care, self-care. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I've, been called, I've been called worse than healthy. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so then I, I guess it's, then moving um, on to in terms of, you know, we're, we've got the fashion awards just a few yes. weeks away. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's an, a, an incredible sort of groundswell of creativity happening mm. in the city right now in terms of mm -hmm. design and fashion. Who are some, you know, designers who, who you're, appreci you know, have a deep appreciation for right now, either like just following yeah. them or through wearing them? I work. love um, Harris Reed, obviously. Um, incredible um, seeing the year that they've had and turning dreams into reality is um, phenomenal. Um, Robert Wan, I, I love who he champions and who he dresses and the emphasis on um, supporting queer talent um, in a time when not everybody does until it's undeniable and then kind of like holding on and, you know, just kind of like going for the person that you know you're going to benefit from. Just like, I love people that nurture talent, yeah. that um, under, like understand that, you know, you don't need to wait until someone has a Netflix deal to support them. I think it's mm -hmm. really important. Um, I love, I love... I love 16 Arlington and I love what they were doing um, in terms of, you know, camp. I, I think it's, you know, I, I love that. I love that aesthetic. I love, you know, I, I love a feather applique. Mm -hmm. um, I love a sequin. Um, Halpen. I love Halpen. Um, I love Alighieri jewellery and the, um, the storytelling behind um, their pieces. Um, there's so much amazing British fashion out there and jewellery. Stephen Webster 
is incredible. I love how he um, incorporates elements of nature into jewelry, and you can look at like a piece and you're like, oh, it's a scorpion. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I I love like storytelling in fashion, and um, I mean that's why I fell in love with um, Alexander McQueen and. I'm yet to see those kind of levels of shows and I want to see that I want to see like the immersive experience and I love like photographers like David LaChapelle like um Nick Knight like Tim Walker where you feel like you are stepping into their world and that's you know what I you know that's what I really revere. That's that's what I feel is needed. And I feel like that's all coming back. And I do think it's coming back. I have is. to say, I mean, off the back of this show season, it was so nice to see how many people were investing in putting on a show that felt like a real experience yeah. rather than just like clothes in a black box, like coming uh-huh. down a runway. And I feel so like people feel are more open to it. Yeah. You know, like, you remember when Lady Gaga came out in like 2012 and like people were like, oh God, this bitch. Yeah. And, yeah. and like now, like, I feel like we're in this place where like, you know, Lady Gaga comes comes out and oh thank god and like like house of gucci and like the looks and like you know what lady gaga really did restart the fashion industry and get got people to understand what fashion really was and like kind of took it from this thing that was like you know kind of like for the upper echelons and like really democratized and got people excited and said that this is all for you as well you can appreciate this you can you know this this is for you to express yourself and fashion doesn't need to just be you know the most expensive thing on the rack it can just be the thing that you gravitate towards that makes you feel fucking amazing yeah. And I think she's, you know, such a great shout as well. She so that McQueen Sorry, show. I didn't swear. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> the um the McQueen show with the armadillo shoe. Mm. That was my first ever McQueen show and my first Paris Fashion Week experience. And that was when Gaga premiered mm-hmm. her song mm-hmm. Bad Romance mm-hmm. on Show Studio mm-hmm. and broke the internet. Yeah. And that was like a real milestone in terms of the democratization of fashion because yeah. you had all these people like tuning in from all over the world. Yeah. People are going to look this incredible yeah. McQueen show. People are going to look back at like Gaga and like the impact that she had on the fashion industry. I mean, even if you look into like how she revolutionized the music, I mean, I sound like a Gaga stan and I kind of am, (laughs) but like, I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not being paid and I'm not, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not necessarily like the biggest stand, but like I've got a huge appreciation for her as a talent and as a force and as a woman. And, um, you know, with the Mughal Air shows as well that she yeah. did with Nicola, like, um, like in- incredible, just incredible. I, I mean, I love um, what Casey's doing with Mughal Air as well. Like those shows, that last show was incredible. I've watched that video so many times and it's just incredible. I I love how, you know, shows are now, as we said, like online because it's the democratization of fashion shows. It's no longer just for, you know, the Annas and um, everybody. It's, you know, it's really about, you know, the people. And I think that that's the power of social media as well. It's kind of like opened up all of these things, opened up the music industry, opened up the film industry. Talent is now not being gatekept. And that's what's so exciting about it. Thank God for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm being signaled. I think we're like nearly at time. So they've I've got some like really kind of fun rapid fire questions for you okay. to wrap up. <laughs> um, they're very kind of like light and funny. So um, your first fashion crush, the first piece of clothing that you really, really loved. Oh God. <laughs> when I first started my transition, I really... I just, I loved, like, dressing sexy. I, I was, you know, like, I was also trying to... coming back. Yes. Yeah. I was like, you know, I loved a bandage dress. It was around the time when Hervé <laughs> Leger. <laughs> I loved, do you know what, actually? I was, like, looking through my closet and I was having a little throw out because um, I was donating to, I did a campaign with TK Maxx about recycling clothes and donating them and then they get sold and they get given to, um, ca- uh, oh my God, the alcohol. Um, <laughs> so yeah, they get given to um, cancer research um, shops and then that goes to help cure young people's cancers. This is not a rapid fire answer, <laughs> sorry. Um, but um, yeah, I found that dress, and it's the very first dress that, one of the very first dresses that I bought. Was for my it? Transition. And it, it's, 
I don't know if it fits because I was a size eight then and like she's she's grown. <laughs> but <laughs> but I don't know. It, it made me feel so hot. I haven't felt that sexy and I probably look better than I did then in my mind. But like, yeah, I felt hot in that dress. I should try it back on. I, I'm scared that I'm you scared it will break. <laughs> Please, I don't want to break pull it. that dress out. But also, Hervé Leger is also coming back. I just saw it like a women's Hervé wear Leger. dress. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Hervé Leger. It wasn't Hervé Leger. Yeah. Well, it was, yeah, it, 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 it was around that time and it was okay. of that ilk. <laughs> I like that, of that ilk. If I could blush. Um, so, okay, the next one is the holiday romance. Anything you've worn away, possibly got carried away with a local style and then regretted it once you've come back to your home soil. Um, I don't regret fashion choices. Okay. I think, you know, whatever I wear, I felt it at the time. There's lots of stuff that I regret, like kind of years looking back. I mean, but like if I wanted to wear it, then I stand by that choice. I love that. Wear it with your chest. Period. <laughs> Period. Um, so then the one that got away, like that piece that got away that you still long for. I had a Chanel bag and I was mugged. Oh, no. That's yeah. terrible. It was, especially because I was trying to, like, my friends were trying, like, I don't party like I used to, but I was trying to get into my friend's house party and they were not letting us in because they were, we were with some, this is a very long time ago. This is like 10 years ago. I don't party like that anymore. And, <laughs> she says. and, um, and yeah, there was like a dispute and in the time that we weren't being allowed in, someone came along and mugged me and stole my Chanel bag. Rude. And Rude. just terrible. I was like, oh, this is Chanel. Exactly. Don't they know? Means. Obviously, they do. <laughs> that was yeah, the problem. Yeah, it had a big C on it. It was kind <laughs> oh, of sad. God. I had no business being there with that bag. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so then, object of desire, what are you lusting over currently? Oh, God. Um, what am I lusting over? Oh, I usually find myself lusting over like perfume, I have to say, okay. and like jewelry. Um, I've just really started to have a, an appreciation for like, um, yeah, jewelry storytelling. I don't know. I, I don't know where that came from. And it's like not a very sustainable thirst to have because it's, <laughs> yeah, slowly draining my bank account. But like, I, I just love like, the craft, and I think it's something that I've never really understood or appreciated, and I never felt like it was for me. Yeah. Um, so, like, yeah, I was actually shooting the other day, and I was eyeing up this necklace. That necklace is beautiful. I keep Thank staring you. at it. Who is it by? It's by Chloe. It's beautiful. And they gave it to me at the end of the shoot, mm. and I was kind of like, they, they just said we could really tell that you loved it and it's got um thorns wrapped around crystals and it's like very similar to like the thorns on the back of my arms on the roses mm, and nice. I don't know I, I think of myself as a rose so yeah you're wearing the necklace very well it's Thank beautiful you. and so your lifelong love what is that piece that you will hold on to forever and never part with um my friend that passed away gave me a Versace purse and mm. um, it's very small and very camp and it's um, very fluffy and it's got like the Medusa side in it. But like it always reminds me of like friends that are no longer with me. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I'm for, it, it was it was a very he gave it to me and I was like, you, you really shouldn't have spent that on me but I didn't really feel like I deserved it but like mm. it's a reminder that you know it's okay to accept like gift giving in whatever way because I don't know you never know when that person's not going to be there anymore so mm. it's like nice to kind of like look back at yeah that's a beautiful note to end on so thank you so much Monroe thank for this you. time Thanks. I could go on all night um and thank, thank you all you for, for being here with us well. yeah thank it was you. fun it was really fun <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this.